It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the movies of February 4th, 1994. Six movies to look at today, so we got a lot to get to. Let's just jump right on into it. And of course, we'll start off with the biggest new release of the weekend, and it's the movie that helped Jim Carrey launch his superstar film career, and that is Ace Ventura Pet Detective. So as I said, Ace Ventura Pet Detective was the movie that kind of launched Jim Carrey's film career. Uh, he was coming towards the end of his run on In Living Color. Actually, he had a good career before that. Like, ten years prior to this, he was in a show called The um, the Duck Factory on NBC, which was on after Cheers. And actually, I don't know, if, I know it ran for at least one season. I can't remember if it was two, but but Jim Carrey had been around long before that, long before this movie came out. But, th like I said before, this is the movie where he his career really took off. This was... Uh, the first of three major hits for him in 1994. We'll get to the other two as we move along, but um, I will say of the three movies, this is probably his weakest one. But at the same time, it's still a fun. It's still one of the, the funnier movies he's been in. It's a really funny movie, and it works because of Carrie's performance in here. Like he's he shows enough charisma and magnitude, and great comedic timing where he makes this work. Like this could have easily been an annoying ass character really quickly, but. Carey just has that charm that works in this movie, and he does a good job here. Like, he really gets that gets this character down, and he has a lot of legitimately funny moments in this movie, a lot of them. And um, good chemistry overall with the cast involved. You got Courtney Cox, Free Friends, uh, Tone Lope, Sean Young, uh, even Dan Marino shows he could be a pretty good actor. Um, this also was the first film directed by Tom Shadyac, who in, he he himself would become a prominent comedy director. Uh, this was his first movie. He, but he's not. But you probably know him from other a lot of other works he's done, including The Nutty Professor with Eddie Murphy, Liar Liar, another Jim Carrey movie, uh, Patch Adams, Bruce Almighty, of course. Um, he hasn't really done a whole lot since the, is in the last couple of years, uh, mostly because of the accident. That, like he had like a, a, I don't know what happened. Like he had like some kind of midlife crisis or something, or something happened where. Um, you know, before I even jump into it, I need to I need to do some research. Okay, it's a good thing I checked. Um, like right around the time Evan Almighty came out in two thousand seven, he had like a post concussion syndrome after he had a bicycle accident in Virginia, and uh, he became more of a philanthropist. So he wasn't really that same. He kind of really wasn't that same guy he was before that, and he kind of he kind of backed away from making com these type of comedies. He made a couple of other movies like um. Uh, the movie I Am, as well as Brian Banks, but um, it's a, it's an interesting story about him. Um, we'll definitely get into it as we go along through his filmography, but um, as far as this movie goes, it's, like I said before, it is still a very funny movie. Even 30 years later, it's a movie that you could still pop it in now, and you'll still be laughing really hard at some of the, hum at the humor in this movie. Some things in here are um, a little bit dated, obviously, and uh, some things in here that could be seen as a little bit controversial, but I'm one of those people. Like for the time, is for the time period, I thought it was okay. Like I th for the time period, it made sense. Nowadays, if you try to do this, yeah, I could pre pretty much see why that is. But in the context of the movie itself, I think it actually works. But I get why people would would look at it this way. If you haven't seen the movie, I'm not even going to bother to spoil. I'm not even going to spoil it for you. But you really should be seeing this movie because it is a legitimately funny movie. It's a very well made film. It shows what Jim Carrey's comic potential could really be and would eventually show. It's just a great movie. If you haven't seen Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, see it. You're doing yourself a huge disservice by not doing so. Um, let's move on to the next movie, and that is Gerard Depardieu and Katherine Heigl in My Father the Hero. Boy, that's a mess of a movie. I mean, uh, this is a remake of a French film called uh, Mon Père si Heroes. I probably said that entirely wrong, but that's the name of the movie that this is based off of, from from uh, France, I should say. But um, Gerard Tate in it from Green Card. Uh, like I said, Catherine Heigl, pre Grey's Anatomy. I think this is actually one of her first film roles she ever did. You also have Lauren Hutton in here, Stephen Toblerowski. A pretty good cast, but just a really bad premise. Like, I really don't understand what they were thinking when they made this movie. It's basically a divorced father trying to make his daughter happy by just going along with these lies that she she keeps putting out it's just like how am i supposed to find that charming like how is anybody with a brain supposed to find that charming and not just like 
it reminds me a little too much of Just Go With It. Kind of that same kind of movie where they just keep piling on lies and lies and lies. And everybody's just expect, supposed to just, as the title indicates, just go with it. But, um, it. but it doesn't make any sense. And here it really doesn't make any sense whatsoever. I really don't know what the heck they were trying to do with this. It just didn't seem all that funny whatsoever in store in terms of story or the way it's presented. It's just it's just not a very good movie at all. I guess if there's anything of note about this movie, uh, the Baja men are in it. Of course, who, of course they're known for who let the dogs out. But um, yeah, I literally found that out while I was looking up this movie, and I had no idea they were in there. But um, keep in mind, it's been over. It's been almost over ten years since I've seen this movie, and what I remember of it was not very good. So. I mean, I guess at least these two moved on to better projects than this because, man, this was not a very good movie at all. This was not a good comedy whatsoever. It's one of the worst movies from 1994, and uh, that's pretty much all I got for you on that one. So let's move on to the next movie that we have here, and that is James L. Brooks's I'll Do Anything, which has probably one of the most unique production histories I've ever seen, but um, I'll delve more into that. you think that this is a musical this is going to be some kind of co musical comedy and it was going to be that way uh james l brooks wanted to make this like an old-fashioned movie musical with parodies of hollywood lifestyles and movie cliches and uh cost oh, this movie cost 40 million dollars and they actually had songs by carol king sinead o'connor and prince and it was going to be chore choreographed by tyler Thwop, thorpe i should say but uh, when they showed this to preview audiences, the music was mostly negative. The production numbers of the film were all cut. Brooks had to write several different scenes, filmed over three days, spent seven weeks in editing. And it was just a movie that just completely fell apart almost immediately. Like, here in the trailer, it was supposed to be released by Christmas, but they delayed it to February. Which should probably give you a sign of how the movie ends up becoming. And as far as the final product goes, it's... I'll put it this way... It's not terrible, but you could definitely tell that they this was supposed to be something much, much different. I mean, it really is hard to make this type of a film when you have these production problems and you had a completely different idea at the beginning to what it eventually becomes now. And and this was just a this was just a bad misconception by James L. Brooks, and I really think that honestly, I think he had the right idea, but. Just the wrong execution for this. I think if I would have been interested to see what the musical numbers were like in this to kind of compare this to. I hope one day we actually get to see those things because, you know, lately we've been getting movies with a lot of deleted footage that have been showing up almost th over, over decades later. We saw that with Planes, Trains, and Automobiles recently. Uh, this movie obviously doesn't have that same kind of legacy, but... I mean, I'd be curious to see what the stuff, what the stuff that they cut out actually looked like. Maybe it could have been good. Maybe it could have been bad. Let's see what that stuff is, because you, ne you never know. You might actually ha ha have something really interesting there. But um, yeah, as far as the movie itself goes, it's just okay. It's a movie that I think most of the performances work very well. Nick Nolte, Albert Brooks, Julie Kavner, Jolie Richardson, Tracy Ullman, uh, Jolie Fisher's also in here, Vicki Lewis, Anne Hesch, Ian McKellen, uh, Maria Patillo, Jake Busey, Harry Shearer, Rosie O'Donnell. Uh, just a lot of notable names in here. But like I said... I feel like it could have been something more if we'd seen what those musical moments could have added to the story. I think those story, those musical numbers really could have added something here, but as far as the movie itself goes, it's fine. It's a one For a one-time watch, it's perfectly fine, but there really could have been something more. You could definitely tell when you watch it. Like I said, as it is, fine for what it is, but there's certainly more that could have been, at, that could have been said if the musical numbers were brought back in here. At least I think there would have been. Um, with that said, on to the next movie, and that is Mario Van Peebles, Christopher Lambert, and Dennis Leary in Gunman. Generic-ass title for a movie that was filmed over two years ago. This was actually filmed back in 1992, and it didn't get a release until February of 1994. So, on that note, that should probably tell you everything you need to know about how this movie played out. Nobody went to go see it. It's been largely forgotten, and really, from that trailer, you can kind of see why. It looks very generic. It looks very lackluster, just a, just a boring-looking action movie. I don't even know if it's supposed to be an action comedy. It says it's an action comedy, but I don't know. It certainly doesn't show it to me, but um, haven't seen it, so I can't really comment on it too much. So that's Gunman. So 
On to the next movie, and that is Romeo is Burning, starring Gary, o starring Gary Oldman. I'm pretty sure I just said Romeo is Burning. It's called Romeo is Bleeding, and um, starring Gary Oldman. Like, I don't know what the hell's going on there, but this does star Gary Oldman. It follows a psychosexual cat-and-mouse game between him and Lena Olin, who begins to unravel his carefully constructed double life. And, um... I haven't seen this movie, but judging by this, uh, it doesn't really look like there's anything too memorable about it, except I guess Lena only gets naked a lot in this because there's apparently a number of scenes with her in where she's nude, where her nipples are popping out, lingerie, right, that kind of stuff. So usually a good script probably would have pop, would have probably made that worth it, but um, yeah, you could if you really want to see that, just go online and look at look for it. I did afterward, but um. Um, as far as I know, John Bon Jovi apparently had a song he w had for this, but, uh, he was dissatisfied with the preview screenings for this, and he basically said, nah, I'm gonna take this somewhere else, man. It's just like, he even said the script was great, the movie wasn't, and, uh, you could, I don't know, the movie pretty much does, looks like what you think it's gonna be, despite a pretty promising cast, Olman, Olin, Annabella Fiore, Juliette Lewis, Roy Scheider, uh, Tony Sirico, James Cromwell, Ron Perlman, Dennis Farina has an uncredited an uncredited scene here. Um, this pro judging by this, the cast probably is doing okay, but the script is probably just like very generic, not really all that exciting, and just kind of mediocre at best. So, yeah, yeah, I kind of I kind of figured this movie's probably not, doesn't have much of a lasting impact. And um, considering I'd never even heard of it until I did the research here, I probably f would think that would be the case. So. So that's Romeo is Bleeding. Let's move on to the last movie that we have here, as I get the title here, and that is Paris, France. Apparently the second movie this weekend that is using sex to sell itself, and but in this case, it's probably for the better, because uh, the movie I think has gotten a lot better reviews than Romeo is Bleeding does. I can't really comment on it for, for certain, but... Um, I mean, it looks visually not nice. There are some nice visuals to the movie. I mean, there's a scene that I think I cut from the trailer there at the end where you have the main main girl, Leslie Hope, uh, looking at Paris, France outside the window, and it's a nice-looking matte painting. So, I mean, I can't really comment on it because I haven't seen it, but, um, I mean, it's got some problem. It looks like it could be pretty good. Um, other than that, though, I've got, no I've got nothing else to say about it other than it looks nice. Could be worth it, but um, it's not something I'm going to rush out to see right away. But, um, yeah, so that's Paris, France. And so on that note, we wrap up another edition of Time About the Movies. Next time we meet, uh, we'll look at President's Day weekend, 1994, Valentine's Day weekend, I should say, uh, 1994, with four movies, including uh, Alec Baldwin and Kim Basinger in The Getaway, because, you know, their last attempt together in the movie worked out so well with The Marrying Man. Uh, we also have Blank Check, probably one of the most bizarre Disney movies ever. I know just by looking at the poster, probably you wouldn't think that, but um, if you really look at the movie, you might be you might be surprised on what you're going to see. Uh, we also have the sequel, My Girl 2, and also The Cement Garden. So four movies to look at. We'll look at them on the next episode. But until then, thank you very much for watching, and if you want to see more videos like this, please hit the playlist on the next page, check out the previous episode. And I will see you guys tomorrow for another episode. So thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. And until then, as always, take care.